Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. It's on the secrets of engaging with China. Uh, my name is Paul O'Donnell, and I'm the Public Affairs Director at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've got three great sessions lined up today. Um, firstly, we'll hear from John Edwards, who's HM Trade Commissioner for China. Uh, then secondly, uh, we've got a panel discussion with some, uh, some experts in international trade in China. Uh, and we'll look at how different perhaps China is going to, is, is as an export market and some of those uh, some of those themes that are emerging. Uh, and then the third session is an overview of the China Export Accelerator, uh, which is um, a product that's uh, been developed by Asiability and Deloitte, uh, that's aimed at helping you get the most out of a relationship with China. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we've got a couple of uh, a couple of polls. So the next slide, please. So the first poll, uh, if uh, if you can fill out, if you can answer this. Uh, poll one, how do you feel about China as an export market? Are you deeply sceptical? Apprehensive, you, you can see the rewards, but there are also some risks. Neutral, it's no different to any other market. There are plenty of others that are, you know, have some of the same challenges. You're optimistic, you've got clear opportunities, you've got some experience as well. Or are you a real China champion? You've already had success and you really want to build on that. So if I can give you just a couple of seconds to uh, to answer those. Okay, and then the uh, second poll that we have. Oh no, we have sorry, we have the results of the first poll before the second poll. Uh, so there's quite a mix there actually. Uh, quite a lot of people are or joint top is uh, optimistic and apprehensive. Um, relatively few people are deeply skeptical. Quite a small number of real champions and uh, neutral in the middle. So that's that's actually quite an interesting mix that. Um, okay, so could we go to our second poll, please? Um, this is just a little bit about uh, about our audience. So, which industry sector best describes your business? You can see the uh, see the options on the screen there. If you can just tick one, that'd be brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Do we get the results of that poll as well? Okay, so it's a it's a it's a real mi it's a mixture again. Uh, quite a lot of manufacturers, uh, quite a few professional services, digital economy, uh, relatively few in life sciences, advanced technologies, and a few raw materials people as well in agricultural. So uh, yeah, again, really good mix and, a, and an interesting mix there between manufacturing and services. Okay, so that's great. Great. Okay. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, it's John Edwards. Uh, John is HM Trade Commissioner uh, for China, based out in Shanghai. Um, he's been with the Foreign Commonwealth Office for 25 years and was first in uh, Shanghai in 2000. Uh, he's now been based in China for the last 10 years and was appointed HM Trade Commissioner just last year. So uh, over to you, John. And perhaps before you before you sort of start, can I go to ask perhaps a little bit about that first question uh, that we had in terms of the mixture of views that people have got about the opportunities of China and the challenges of China, um, and you know how 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 mature you feel that uh, British businesses are in their approach to to China. Obviously, you know, it's been um, you know Western business engagement's been going on in China for sort of 25 years, um, but do you think that British businesses really understand a you know the sort of the the scope and the depth and the amount of engagement, the level of engagement they could have, uh, but also be uh, quite how China's changing as well. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, I was actually quite uh, encouraged by that poll. I thought it looked like uh, the people online were both realistic about some of the challenges because it is a a complex environment, but also uh, were uh, aware of the scale or the potential scale of the reward uh, and also that there was a good 
body of people there who had had success already in the market, which is what you need to be able to encourage more people to enter into the uh, into the market. In terms of uh, whether or not business uh, British business is ready for the China market, I think that uh, we've probably taken a bit of a step back over the last uh, year and a half for obvious reasons with COVID. Um, and I think that what we haven't seen quite as much over the last 18 months is people coming out here and seeing the China market. I suspect that will continue to be the case. I suspect China will continue to have very tight board controls for the next year. So I think uh, events like this are actually really helpful in uh, giving us an opportunity to say to people back in the UK, look, this is what the China market's like. Are you interested with all its complexity, all its rewards? Are you interested in it? I think it is probably still true that in aggregate, people in the UK who have not been physically out to China may still not be aware quite of the scale and of the opportunity uh, and the market here. I think if you were primarily based in the UK and primarily basing your opinion of China on how it is portrayed on a daily basis in the UK media, you would probably see more of the risk and the complexity and probably be less exposed to the size of the opportunity in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's really interesting. And so I'm just, just going to ask you a question there about something that uh, uh, was, uh, you know, something that I, I spent a lot of time uh, earlier in my career uh, doing various trade shows um, in the manufacturing sector around China, um, so in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, how fast do you do, do you have a sense of how fast China is returning to? To live events and to you know welcoming people uh, you know, on onto the ground into country, uh, you suggested perhaps it might be a year or more uh, before they're welcoming international travellers on the scale that we perhaps saw saw, saw in the past. Is that is that is, is that right? Uh, so I think there's two slightly different questions there. In terms of live events on the ground, we've been running live events here since uh, September of last year. But the primarily, and that, that includes very large events, uh, the China International Import Expo, for example, uh, we had about 30,000 people a day going to them. So big events. And, and so now life in China feels pretty much back to normal. There are no visible restrictions. People wear masks, but there are no really visible COVID restrictions. And there haven't been for about nine or 10 months. Um, but in terms of opening up the borders, I mean, maybe I'm being, I hope I'm being too pessimistic but my assumption is that they will retain some level of quarantine for all inbound travelers uh, into 2022 and possibly quite far into 2022 because at the moment they have uh, a population that has not been exposed to covid they also have a number of vaccines that have rolled out which the efficacy rate uh, for transmission is lower than, for example, AZ or Pfizer. And so that presents some problems for them until they have reached high levels of uh, immunity amongst the population. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so do you think that, 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 that um, you know, what sort, of, uh, what sort of things are you looking at putting in place, as you said, uh, at the, uh, um, from DIT's point of view to, you know, to encourage people to do business virtually? Well, we moved. What what we did, we moved last year quite rapidly uh, into, as 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 everyone did, into online promotion. So last year we actually, in the end, ran more events than we would normally have run. We ran a total of eighty seven events across the year. By the at the beginning of the year, those were mostly purely online events. Mm -hmm. Then uh, they moved to uh, hybrid events and offline. And so what we find is that a purely online event cross border uh, is more difficult to take it from the event through to business matching and, and creating that buzz around the event. We try and do offline events, which means we will have normally a physical presence and a physical event in country and we will bring in online uh, elements to it. Uh, one of the things that we are also hoping to launch in the next month or so is our own uh, digital platform within China. As people online will probably know, China has its own digital ecosystem. Uh, China doesn't have WhatsApp, Twitter, doesn't have uh, Amazon, etc. Um, most, uh, but it is also the world's largest cross-border e-commerce market by quite a long way. 
uh, uh, so we are looking to increase our digital platforms and presence here both ourselves with the DIT platform that will be bilingual and hosted here and available and, and, and mobile to which British exporters we are looking to list British exporters if they're interested in that but also we are working quite hard with some of our uh, e-commerce partners so for example today we launched with jd.com for their big uh, cross-border e-commerce 618 in internal um, uh, uh, online um, festival online shopping festival launched a British pavilion uh, for that and we will be doing more marketing for our partners uh, organizations as well back to UK SMEs okay great let's get a couple of questions in from uh, people who are attending the seminar um, I've got a question uh, around Hong Kong and you know the extent to which the uh, relation the trading relationship with Hong Kong uh, is evolving and changing and the question is is selling into Hong Kong now the same as selling into China uh, no I think the, the short answer to that is no I think the question with Hong Kong is a complex question it's a political question obviously around what we've seen over the last couple of years which is causing some uh, uh, quite genuine political tensions with China uh, because they haven't been um, well, they, they have not been uh, adhering to the uh, one country two systems and that is a severe problem but in terms of selling into exporting into China uh, uh, Hong Kong remains its own own, own customs area uh, it still has uh, uh, functioning rule of law and courts uh, it has a separate uh, economic system and actually if you look at the way in which we work I'm the trade commissioner for China that includes Hong Kong but we have a team in Hong Kong uh, led by my colleague Nick Heath and they work very much within Hong Kong and within that Hong Kong ecosystem. So if you're selling into Hong Kong, I mean, feel free to come to me or to my team, but I, um, we have a team dedicated in Hong Kong who are experts in Hong Kong. In terms of the wider economic complementarity, I mean, it depends what you are doing. Uh, I think what is true is that for us, a, an increasing focus is on uh, the connectivity between Hong Kong and the mainland, particularly around financial services. Uh, mm -hmm. There's things called Wealth Connect and Insurance Connect, which offer uh, an ability for people based in Hong Kong to sell their services more into uh, mainland to mainland China customers. So that's a big area for us, but that's a relatively uh, specialised uh, sector. If you're selling goods into Hong Kong, I don't think there is a significant change okay um and i've got another question uh that's around the um i think this possibly is is uh is somebody speaking from experience uh of having been burnt by ip issues in the past um now i, I as i understand it that's something that the chinese government is attempting to uh to make real progress on um you know I'm sure pressed by you know, not least uh, not least UK government. Is that something you can uh, you can perhaps talk about the developing uh, IP protection system? Yes, uh, I think it's quite an interesting an, uh, an interesting one. So it depends what you mean by IP. So you'll see probably if you if you read a lot of the the, the media and the news, you will see a lot about IP theft. Now, if you are, it's not a very precise term, it's not one that I tend to use, it's not one that uh, industry uh, experts tend to use very much. Mm. If you're talking about uh, IP theft in the sense of cyber enabled attacks on IP, that still exists. China has done that, we called them out on it, etc. Uh, but move that to one side, and that's obviously very serious and needs to be dealt with. If you are looking at IP protection in market, copyright, trademarks, etc. It is still not perfect, but there are a number of things that are improving uh, that I'd point to. One is the legislative framework is getting better and stronger. And we're seeing that in areas, for example, broadcast rights, etc. You know, the actual framework and the laws are improving. The second is that enforcement is improving. And that is largely driven by the need increasingly for Chinese domestic firms to protect their own IP. Uh, if you also look at the figures for international companies winning IP disputes within China, uh, those are 
uh, increasing as well and actually quite high in terms of the number you know if a if it goes to court it is not the case as it may have been 20 years ago that the foreign ip holder would routinely lose you know home court etc actually i think the figures are much more positive than that the third area which i think is improving and you know, maybe kind of blowing the trumpet ourselves of, of dit is our professionalism and others in supporting and helping companies on in ip has grown over the last uh five or ten years so we now have a dedicated IP, uh, intellectual property office IP attache here uh, and a team here. We have produced guidelines and guidance, including things such as um, template uh, IP protection uh, uh, um, forms that you need to fill in, guides on how you do it, what would what you should be putting into a contract, etc. So that when you, if and when you enter the market here, you know that you are uh, properly defended in the market. So in the past, I think people may enter the market and then find that uh, they hadn't necessarily protected their IP in the way that it is required within China for you to protect your IP. And then bad actors may come and trademark, copyright squatting or what have you. Uh, and then it's quite difficult to take legal redress. Right. So now we are helping, we have a better suite of help for people coming in. Uh, there is a better legal framework and there is better implementation. It's still not perfect. I'm not pretending it, it is, but I think the direction of travel is by and large positive. So is the message to uh, potential UK traders then to get in contact uh, with you guys early in the process and you know avail themselves of that help, avail themselves of that advice as early as possible um, and sort of, you know, get that embedded into their uh, uh, into their plans as they move into uh, into market yeah i think uh well, as i'm sure you fully agree paul uh if you have ip you need to protect and you need to think about ip in the broader sense it's not just a copyright it's not just a patent it's not just a trademark it may be the way in which you do business but if you have intellectual property which is at the heart of your business uh if you have a China strategy or China market entry strategy, you need an IP protection strategy. Mm. And we are here to kind of help you think that through and work that through with you. Um, I've got a question, um, I'm assuming from uh, from one of the manufacturers uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar, um, who asks that given that China is now becoming so sophisticated uh, in its manufacturing, uh, what are the opportunities for UK manufacturers to, uh, to look at exporting to China? Well, uh, I think there still are uh, significant uh, opportunities. I think that you're right. It will depend now. Well, two things I would say. One is uh, it is likely to be in areas which are relatively high end and niche. Um, so if you were to look at uh, in the auto industry, for example, there are still opportunities uh, around uh, lightweighting. I think, for example, if you look in the clean tech sector, which is a huge growing area here, you might say, I mean, we don't have turbine manufacturers in the UK, but we do actually have people who do very specific bits of kit that can help regulate and get, you know, the, the transmission, etc. So it will be relatively, um, I think, relatively uh, sophisticated and targeted areas. I think also, if you are a manufacturer, Again, it would be worth coming to come speak to DIT about how you would enter into the China market. A lot of people are talking at the moment about decoupling, uh, but I think a lot of people who talk about decoupling don't necessarily fully understand what they mean when they talk about decoupling. If you look actually at the moment, at the most recent, for example, European Chamber of Commerce survey that came out just uh, a week ago or so, it shows some quite interesting, almost counterintuitive things, given how much we see about decoupling. It said, for example, that the number of companies within China who were thinking of uh, European companies who were thinking of investing more and in expanding their operations in China was an all time high. And those that were thinking of leaving China was an all time low. And that the number of uh, companies, uh, European companies within China who were thinking of increasing their supply chain from within China was five times higher at 25 percent than the number who were thinking of decreasing their supply chain exposure to China, which is only about 5%. And what I think, therefore, you're seeing rather than decoupling, 
is a retrenchment with more and more manufacturers uh, taking an in China, for China, for the world uh, approach, which means that they would manufacture in China for the Chinese market. And I think if you're going to do that, that is a qualitatively uh, larger and more complex operation than cross-border sales. Uh, and again, we'd be very happy to kind of talk and, and, and work, work with people on that. Okay, um, we're getting a couple of questions in about uh, how to contact you uh, and contact your team. Um, do you want to? Uh, do you want to? Do you want, do you want, do you want to let us know? Well, fine. I mean, uh, I think we have a generic email. There's two ways, I guess, to contact DIT more generally. So the first is if you go to the Export is Great uh, website and type in your um, uh, postcode, it will give you your international trade advisor. Your international trade advisor will then be the first point of contact if you have a generic discussion about um, about uh, DIT and support for exporting. If you are interested in China, they may then pass you on to what is the, called the uh, Enhanced International Support Service, which is a bespoke kind of four hour program of support around China, which as you know, Paul, then leads through to more in-depth uh, uh, um, uh, support and business support, including in, of course the accelerator that you'll be doing later on today. If you are looking specifically to contact us uh, out at post, I will provide, I don't actually have, I want to, be, I want to give the right, the right, so if, if there's anyone here that just wants to write to me directly, that is absolutely fine. It would be john, J-O-H-N dot edwards at fco.gov.uk and I can make sure that gets to the right uh, sector team. Uh, otherwise, if there is a recording of this or you're sending something around after Paul, I can send a more generic uh, email as well. There will be a recording of this and we'll, 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 we'll make sure that that's sent out to, uh, uh, to all participants. John, thank you so much for your uh, uh, for your time. That's been really, really, really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, we really value your uh, value your contribution. And thank you very much. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll get some contacts from uh, from our, our our webinar participants. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so we now turn to the second part of our discussion. Uh, which is the panel session that we have um, on how how is China different as an export market? Uh, what things do you need to consider and what things are changing? Uh, so we've got a fantastic panel uh, for you. So can you just put the next slide up, please? Uh, so we have Kevin Shakespeare. Uh, Kevin uh, worked in the private sector, largely for Lloyds Bank, but also for some FM, FMCG roles as well. Uh, he is now Director of Academy uh, at the Institute of Export and International Trade and the Dean of the UK Customs Academy. And we have David Percival. Uh, David had a successful career in the UK civil service, including a spell as head of UKTI in China based in Shanghai. Uh, he's now Managing Director of the China International Business Group at Deloitte, Vice Chair of the British Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai and Chairman of the Manchester China Forum. Uh, and we also have Andrew Caney. Andrew had a long and varied career in consulting, uh, including uh, at the Boston Consulting Group and Booz & Co, where he was managing partner for Greater China. Uh, he's now a fellow of the Royal United Services Institute and the director of the UK National China, sorry, UK National Committee on China. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so we've got five themes for discussion um, and I'll run through them and I will uh, direct each theme uh, to uh, the member of our panel who's perhaps, uh, perhaps best placed to, uh, uh, to answer that. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first up we've got uh, geopolitics and non-market risks, something uh, that often uh, hit the news, it hits the news uh, when we're uh, talking and thinking about China. Um, so, uh, Andrew, can I uh, can I ask you perhaps to uh, uh, to kick off with some thoughts on uh, on the geopolitics of uh, business in China? Sure, thanks very much, Paul, and, and delighted to be here. Yes, as you touched on and John Edwards touched on previously, we we see a lot about China on the BBC and elsewhere in our media today. 
uh, G7 in Cornwall. And the topics we hear about are often quite challenging or critical and uh, difficult to resolve. Issues in Hong Kong, questions about Xinjiang, US-China relations, this big question of decoupling and so on. And what I think gets lost in all that and what we don't really hear much about is business. Um, it doesn't quite get the headlines in the same way. So yes, the geopolitics are important, uh, but beneath all these uh, news items, uh, there's just a lot of companies getting on and selling, exporting, doing business with China, and indeed growing in, in a very rapid way. Uh, foreign brands are still doing very well in China, even though there's been some tension, for example, about Xinjiang cotton and H&M had problems in China. Again, a few cases uh, which hit the headlines distort the context. Uh, China is a, a more political environment. Trade can get caught up in political disputes and tensions between countries. And practically what that might mean is slowdowns of customs or some approvals or an increased tax audit. But I would say in general that the, the bark is worse than the bite. There's, there's a lot of talking, uh, but when you drill down to times like 2013 when Britain had annoyed China by having David Cameron talk with the Dalai Lama, trade investment continued to grow. Norway had a salmon ban. It just exported salmon via Hong Kong. So there are issues. Uh, you need to be aware of them uh, and you need to not become over-dependent uh, in a particular source. But there's a lot more noise uh, than substance and one can separate a lot of these topics that are in the news from just the day-to-day -day practicalities of exporting your stuff to China. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, would either of our other panelists, uh, I know, perhaps David, do you want to just add a little thought to that? Um, well, just very quickly, that um, I always find that the business business finds a way. Um, uh, the uh, we, we 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 always find a way in export and do business with China. Right. Okay. Okay. Can we have uh, the uh, next slide, please? Okay. So the second uh, theme that's uh, that's coming out is. Uh, around market research and the need to uh, product localization, uh, sort of really almost at the beginning of your uh, of, a, of, of a China engagement strategy. So, um, David, do you want to uh, do you want to come in on this a little bit? Yeah, obviously it's a, it's a huge topic and, and something everybody be looking at you know, pre-China and, and during that China journey. I think what China gives you is scale, size of market, and and then speed of change. So. In terms of scale, it's worth you know, sort of being in a mindset about ent entering a continent rather than a country. Think about you know going into Europe rather than going into one country because that's the diversity of the market as well. Um, and and as it's got more sophisticated, the ability to do really good market research is there. So actually pinpointing cities, age groups, and, and demand is increasing. So there is the ability to do that in the market and, and, and companies are really uh, using that to good effect to pinpoint exactly who and where to sell their goods and, and actually that that not surprisingly um, touches on the, 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 the you know the, the world's biggest online market and actually Deloitte research is showing that during the pandemic that's increased very significantly particularly in younger consumers in China we're seeing about 50 percent increase in healthcare spend on online um, and these are imported goods and we're seeing beauty products up by 85 percent coming in from overseas that's online buying so the the already large online consumer market is, is definitely increasing and lots of evidence as well that it's expanding across china the the commercial hubs of beijing shanghai and around hong kong but actually across the whole sort of 200 cities in China with about a million people, seeing lots of evidence that the, the demand for foreign goods is increasing there. So being able to pinpoint your, your market is, is, is really important and, and something, something that can now be done a lot more effectively than it could have done a few years ago. Um, as we go to China, most, most British companies will not be competing on price, they'll be competing on quality and, and, and high, putting high-end products into the market. And, and I think there it's important to understand um, the competition and, and, and look and see what others are doing. China demands a world-class product now, absolutely. So you need to be careful that you're, you can be positioned at the right price in the market and find out what 
your competitors are doing in China, but also that includes foreign foreign competitors as well, because everybody will be thinking the same discussion given the, the scale and size of the market. Um, certainly worth speaking to your lawyers. Um, um, absolutely, most sectors will have specific issues and opportunities to, to try and overcome. Um, and, and you know the, the IP issue is key, but in areas like beauty products, food and drink, it's need, you need to understand exactly what is required legally to get your products into the market. And that's changing all the time. So having that sort of legal research is, is very important. Um, I've always found that actually having a close look at what the Chinese government is up to is, is critical. Um, the Chinese government policies drive the economy. It's a, it's a, it's a, a managed economy still, even though fast moving into a service economy. If you give an example of, of the, the um, uh, Xi Jinping's carbon neutral target of 2060, those policies are having a massive market impact already. And already the market is, is demanding uh, goods and services that will help fuel um, that re renewable energy need to go carbon neutral by 2060. So having a good understanding of the Chinese government and the policies that are driving the economy is often very helpful in, in the market uh, as you look for the market. And, and the final point is that um, is, is do the research but re react on it quickly because the market moves so quickly it'll go out of date. So, so don't sit for too long on the research because otherwise you, you, you need to follow it up with an execution strategy. It's expensive, it's worth doing, of course, but you need to then, then execute if, if that's your plan. Mm. I was going to ask you actually, David, to, uh, to say a little bit more about, about market research. One of the first things you said was actually that, you know, the capability and capacity for getting really good market research in China is, uh, is growing and is developing, which you know, that, 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 that was certainly uh, an issue uh, in the past. Is that, is that something, you know, where, where, where should firms be going in order to you know to to access that research and uh, and to find out about that well obviously um, I, I would say Deloitte will do it for you but the, uh, there are lots of channels like that i mean the 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 drive to be able to do sophisticated data mining um that's definitely the, um, you know that that is really make, making a market difference so there's a, there's a range of companies that can help you with that um and you can get some good really good research, the headline research from um, Department of International Trade, China British Business Council, those organisations, but you know, to dive down into actual real you, you, uh, you know, niche products or your products and find the best place, the best people and the rest region of China, then, then, that, then you know, that, that can be done um, by, by many consultancy firms. And perhaps Andrew, I don't know whether you might be able to say anything about uh, China's transition to a low carbon economy in the political direction uh, for that, perhaps? Well, there's a, there's a lot of um, push behind that. The commitment is now very clear, public, uh, and as, as David touched on, being cascaded down through the organization, uh, through the, the organization in a sense, because the country is, uh, has this commonality of, of purpose, wants direction to set through the the planning process and party leadership announcements. I, I think the, the a key thing to bear in mind is how important um, a healthy environment is beyond the carbon question, but clean air, uh, access to water, those sorts of aspects of China's environment, uh, many of which have suffered through the rapid economic growth of the past 40 years, and um, which you know, the Chinese people and the Chinese leadership are taking very clear steps to address already. There's a lot of substance behind this, and we seen it already in the much cleaner skies in, in Beijing and elsewhere. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the next uh, theme for our discussion uh, is around compliance and regulation. Um, so, Kevin, could I uh, perhaps ask you to have a uh, to talk a little bit about this? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I think it's important to recognise that some of the good practices around exporting trade and customs procedures equally apply when you're exporting to China as to any other country in the world. And, and, and there are a lot of similarities there. So we shouldn't always see China as being this huge, difficult market from an export cross-border sale perspective. And, um, and even if you're an e-commerce provider, you are a uh, trading services. Um, some of the good practices apply to any country in the world. 
So that in terms of compliance and regulation, that, that will include customs compliance. But it is important to recognize that uh, China introduced a new integrated customs system in 2018. And in terms of it meeting its commitments under the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, China exceeds the upper income level. So Chinese customs procedures are efficient. Uh, and, and the actual time at, time at border, documentary and border compliance has reduced dramatically um, over the last few years. So it's important to recognize that China does have efficient customs procedures. Yes, there will be uh, uh, additional requirements, the likes of export health certificates, phytosanitary certificates, but that's no different from um, uh, any countries. Yes, there will be a requirement in certain, uh, certain types of goods for uh, import license, fumigation certificates, pest control. But again, that, that's no difference. It's important that businesses recognize what good looks like in terms of, uh, uh, of compliance and regulation. There will be other elements in the context of getting paid. Uh, and it's important to recognize that you need to get your payment terms correctly and, and the role of UK export finance, if for example, you can't get export credit insurance in the private market becomes key in that regard. Uh, good practice around bribery and corruption and, and compliance with the UK Bribery Act is important, but that's important for any country. So it's important to have that, that training on, uh, if you're an exporter on, on bribery and corruption for all your employees. So really, I, I just wanted to emphasize that element is, is, is that <clears throat> customs trade export best practice applies to China in as much as it applies to other countries. One final point I'd like to make, and, and certainly not just for larger businesses, manufacturers, is that the UK and China have an authorized economic economic operator, AEO mutual recognition uh, a, a, a agreement, very much around the safety and security element of AEO. So there is that cooperation there as well. So again, in terms of the ultimate customs and trade professionalization, AEO, that's a factor that businesses should be considering as well. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. And just on, on that last point about AEO, how, how would companies go about finding out how to, uh, uh, how to access that, uh, that mechanism? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are a number of ways. <clears throat> so clearly the likes of organisations like ourselves, Deloitte, will provide services um, in that regard. But uh, I, I think the first thing a business should do is check their current, um, uh, their customs trade compliance history. If you've had a recent audit from customs, that puts you in a good position. Uh, if, if, if you have that good record, you have good written procedures in terms of customs and trade, standard operating procedures, uh, and have good record keeping is essential. And it probably links into one interesting point, Paul, we've alluded to today around e-commerce. So clearly e-commerce is very important. I think businesses, when they're providing e-commerce, need to consider the INCO terms, the international uh, commercial terms that are agreed there. Uh, and that record keeping becomes essential. So even if a fast pass or operator, uh, of, uh, of which there are many, are, are moving the goods by air freight, for example, you must make sure that you have um, all customs declarations, all transport documents as well. That Again, that applies to every country in the world, but don't at, uh, automatically assume if you're an e-commerce operator that your fast parcel operator providing the door-to-door -door service is going to do everything for you. So a uh, good history of trade and compliance uh, and, and then um, uh, uh, d d determine if your business is ready to actually go for AEO status. Right, thank you very much, Kevin. Go for the next slide, please. Okay, so next on go to market strategies. So, uh, um, David, do you want to uh, do you want to say something a little bit about this, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to touch on it. I mean, first of all, on go to market. I mean, for lots of companies in the UK, it's worth thinking about whether whether China is actually looking at you because that's that's there might be some easy wins. I mean, can China access your websites? Have you got translations in Chinese um, and we, we we have spoken to consumer brands in the UK who who thought they had no market in China and then we we do some research and find actually their products have been sold on about 10,000 microsites across China so actually finding out what you know is China looking at you can can you sell from the UK into China quite easily that's certainly worth exploring and then that would lead on to a much more sort of complex market entry strategy linked to e-commerce 
and actually, as has uh, as been alluded to, the, the, the growth of the biggest cons um, uh, import consumer market in the world online is it, it, it is growing over and over and over. And, and, and how you tackle that, how you get on the likes of Tmall, uh, J, JD and Sooning's websites, and then position yourself for, for an entry strategy is important. And that needs, to, but that needs to be negotiated. And that needs to be uh, uh, um, a strategy that works for you and not just for them. Um, so, so that that was, there's some lots of help out there uh, to do that. Also, how you use the e-commerce platforms in China to figure out what the market thinks of your 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 products and services as well. That that's important. Probably the the biggest question we get asked about China is 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 to find you to find the right partner. Now, so, so a partner being many different relationships, but as you go on your journey, you'll decide whether you need a distributor, an agent, whether you're going into manufacturing. It can be all the way through to license agreements and, and, and complex joint ventures. And But I think sort of actually understanding that within those, it's really important to do your due diligence on the partners to make sure that you understand that they're, they're credible, that they can say what they're going, that they, they can um, achieve what they that they promise, um, and then I think it's a mixture of compliance and relationships. You need to build really good relationships with with, with your potential partner. At the same time, make sure it's set up legally and structured well that you both know how things are going to move forward. Because actually, you know, the relationship side is very important, but it has to be matched with with, with compliance, and that that covers sort of all the potential ways into the market. I think. That's really interesting. And actually, that linked really well to our fifth uh, theme for discussion. Do you want to just go to the next slide? Uh, which is relationships and culture. So we've already heard a little bit about that from David. Uh, Andrew, do you want to uh, do you want to add something onto that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And as, as David touches on, as we think about business, I'm, I'm, I'm struck overall by time and again, you know, business is business. It's dealing with people finding mutually attractive deals uh, in a certain context and environment. And I'll say some things about China and what's different, but in many ways, it's not so different. It just puts uh, a sharper focus on, on, on certain aspects. Over the, over the time, people have talked about the famous guanxi, the relationships that one needs in China, or the connections. And yes, having the right relationship, building the right relationship is critical. And there's a very personal aspect to that. I, I think. Often um, people working with, working with China one needs to spend more time touching on some of the non-direct business aspect, building personal relationships, showing some care, spending time. But again, you're going to tell me these are things that are not important in, in dealing in Western relationship. I, I, I think there, there's a commonality there. And this idea that, hey, you know, person X, Y, Z has great relationship to one person and that's what's going to save your China business. No, it's not. What you need is a great product or service. Uh, at the right price with all the right pieces and then find the right relationship to do it with uh, and again asking me to talk about relationships and culture with it's 1.4 billion people it's millions of people dealing with uh, exporters coming in and their people are different you know there's some great people there are some lousy people uh, so you, you need to know who you're dealing with and it, it, it's certainly true because you're going into a, a different culture um, it's worth spending a bit more time to really understand who you're your counterpart is, what they care about, who are the people in their networks at home that they really care about, can either help you in your business or, or hinder you in your business. And yes, the personal connection relationships are very important. As David's talked about, you also need to be legally uh, signed off in the right way, have the compliance, and recognize this is about what you bring to the party and what they bring to the party, and that will change. And how the power balance changes over the time with that is really, really important uh, as much as anything, rather than what's written down on a particular legal contract. Uh, finally, and practically, and I think John Edwards touched on this right at the beginning, um, communicate with your Chinese partners and counterparts in the way they communicate. So email is, is barely used in China for business. If you send an email, they won't read it, never mind reply to it. Uh, and it's not WhatsApp, it's WeChat. So, so get onto WeChat and start sharing photos of your dog or, or something like that on WeChat. And that's going to be a good way forward. Uh, and recognize they may send you the reply on a Sunday and they'll want you to reply back to them quickly and show, you, show you're on it. So a lot of commonalities, actually. 
some differences and, and just that's, that's part of the joy uh, alongside making the money and doing the business of engaging with uh, a, a different culture. That's really interesting, thank you. Um, just looking at a couple of the questions coming through, there's um, something that we touched on a couple of minutes ago around uh, decarbonisation and low carbon agenda. Seems to have uh, struck a nerve with a couple of uh, a couple of uh, people who are on the webinar. Um, I don't know, David, is there anything you can say, particularly perhaps about how SMEs can get involved in uh, in China's decarbonisation? Yeah, I mean, um, with, with um, uh, a DIT, there's a lot going on where you can basically I, I would say, um, do get in touch. What China is looking for is, is technology that can help it in its low carbon transition. And that can come that can come from SMEs as well as the big companies. You just need to navigate how to get in touch with, 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 um, with, with the right contacts in China. But funny enough, in the UK, that's already happening. There's a, there's a, a Chinese um, government um, entity called Tusk Park, which is actually investing in science parks around the UK. To bring on businesses that it can thinks can grow um, these opportunities in China. So actually, there might be solutions in the UK to be able to talk to China. But certainly in the market, as long as you 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 feel that you can be protected, there will certainly be market opportunities for you. Very happy to talk to, to individuals about that. That's great. Um, and we also just had a question through. Um, perhaps it's more perhaps more for Andrew. Uh, perhaps more for David uh, about the differences between different. Uh, different states and regions in China. Are, are there any that are particularly um, easy to do business in or any that are particularly hard to do business in? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to say a few words. I think a couple of, one is it now goes a lot by industry sector and focus what sort of business you're trying to do. The second is that the Eastern Seaboard and Shanghai in particular, and then down around uh, in Guangdong, Shenzhen, those are the areas that are uh, industrialized first, open up to exports first. And so they are more uh, familiar with uh, international business and Western trade. But that's been changing very, very rapidly. If you go to the West of China, uh, the large places, still a lot, of, uh, a lot of Western companies established there. That's brilliant. Um, can we have the next slide, please? We're going to go to a couple of a couple more poll questions. So, uh, if I could ask uh, you to um, give your answers for the question of the areas that uh, which you have the most concerns about exporting to China. So, is it things like skills and experience, finding good partners? We've heard certainly certainly quite a lot about that. Um, corruption and hostile practices, uh, getting caught up in geopolitical issues, or being unsuccessfully unsuccessful in competing against local competitors. If you could. Uh, let us know your thoughts there and we'll perhaps flash back to the panel for a moment. Do we have the results for that? Okay, so corruption hostile practices coming out top there. It's interesting. Um, and finding good partners um, reasonably uh, reasonably high as well. Perhaps Andrew, can I just go to you just for a quick comment on that uh, on that remaining uh, remaining concerns about corruption and hostile practices? Well, it, it's certainly something that one needs to be concerned and aware about and engage with. Um, it, it, it's hard to know, you know who, who, who's replied to which ones, and there are some companies that have had bad experiences in China. Equally, in my experience, it's been a concern people have, which goes down as they, they get more comfortable with doing business in China and see that, that some of the reality is not, not quite as bad as uh, some, of the, some of the stories go. Thank you very much, Andrew. Can we have the next slide, please? This is our next poll question. Um, what more or what should HM government be doing to encourage businesses to export to China? Um, so that's around uh, level playing fields, uh, champion market entry issues, uh, strong sustainable relationships with the China government, uh, comprehensive training, uh, and ensure UK export approval process is not a significant barrier, uh, which I think is probably people who have uh, tangled with export control in the past.
we have the results coming up for that? And then I'll quickly flash to the uh, the panel for their thoughts on that. So comprehensive training for exporters is perhaps the uh, the number one issue there. Um, and then everything else pretty even, but comprehensive training and development seems to be the uh, uh, the number one issue. So if I can just quickly go back to our panel. Uh, Andrew, do you want to perhaps say something on that? 30, 30 seconds or so. Yeah, I mean, I, it's important. It's interesting it's come up so strongly here because the, the skills and experience was lower on the previous poll. And mm. I was going to say a, a lot of these issues can be tackled by getting the right skills and experience. And indeed, you know, training and development is a large part of that, as is getting involved and starting to do stuff on a small scale and, and learning from exposure in the market and bringing in other people who've uh, had experience doing it already. Brilliant. And uh, David? Um, well, we're about to give you a, a, a bit of an opportunity to train and, and learn, learn about China, but I, I, I'm not surprised. I was I, I lived in China for 10 years and at no stage did I ever feel an expert. Uh, I was learning something every day and, and that's that's a wonderful opportunity. But you, 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 you do need to set yourself on a journey to, to either become a China expert or work with China experts because the market's so important and it's not going away. That's brilliant. And Kevin, do you want to say anything about the uh, the importance of getting yourself trained uh, to do exporting well? Yeah, it's a it's a, a a really important angle, and it's important to look across all the elements of the export journey. So um, uh, before you're looking to export, uh, during the negotiation stage, uh, when you're actually exporting, looking at the after uh, the actual after sales element. So really, is the end to end picture that needs to be considered by businesses and all the different factors. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, great. That's uh, thank you very much to our to our panel. Uh, as David said, you're about to hear a little bit more from him. Um, but thank you in particular then to uh, uh, to Kevin and to Andrew. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And then the next one as well. OK, so I'm about to hand over to David and to Ollie Scheel, uh, who is the founder of Ageability. Uh, Ollie began his career in the arts before moving to the side business school at Oxford University, uh, where he was director of development. He then joined Hong Kong uh, Business School as its first head of its European operations, founder of Ageability and the uh, chief executive of the UK National Committee on China. Ollie. Hi. Hi there. If I if I would like, like, just quickly kick off before I part, part, pass over to Ollie, um, what is the China Export Accelerator Program? Well, basically, we we saw a, a market need to um, offer an education program. So this is a high end education program over six weeks online with one of China's top, or actually China's top private business school. Um, but at the same time, we realised the market need to actually to win business. So we've tried to match personal development and business development. So throughout the six weeks program, you will also work with a team individually to try and look at your own personal need, your own business needs, so to, to try and win business for your, your, your company as you go through the journey. Because we thought it was a unique offer to bring those two together and actually try and win business and creating a better um, understanding of China uh, um, for, for UK companies. And, I'll hand it over to Ollie to, to go through the details. Uh, thanks very much, David. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Paul. Next slide. Yeah. So um, when we started working with David and his team at Deloitte and also the team at Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, we really sort of started off with the idea of um, wouldn't it be great if um, feeling that actually there must be a better way, a, a more comprehensive journey on which people can go through in the UK to find expert uh, export success with China. Um, so we seek to bring together the best of best of all worlds in terms of the best consulting, the best coaching, but also the best academic knowledge and, and teaching. Um, in these days of COVID, of course, um, we can seize a program which is entirely online and also part time. Uh, in normal times, we'd have an in-market um, visit as well and uh, I think we probably all look forward to uh, a, a time when we can do that again um, particularly as when John mentioned earlier um, that the B2B matching element is particularly challenging when you can't sit around a table together and have dinner and, and really get to know each other. Um, Paul could we have the next slide please? 
So just a, a short note on the three partners who have come together here. Uh, there's Asiability, which celebrates our sixth anniversary uh, this year, actually, uh, this month. Um, and uh, it's a group of um, senior people who have worked with China back from 1973. Um, and um, we are the lead partner in terms of program management and delivery. Uh, and our clients range from the Eden Project to whiskey to distilleries, um, the European Bank of Reconstruction Development, and, and, and others over, over that period. Um, Deloitte uh, probably needs less of an introduction, uh, one of the largest firms in the world, um, but uh, particularly valuable, I think, in this context, in terms of having the ability to soldier uh, the in-market specialists um, in terms of different sectors across China. Um, Chum Kong Graduate School of Business is probably the most famous business school you probably haven't heard of. Um, in the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, when it was founded by Li Ka Shing, um, who's a Hong Kong uh, entrepreneur, um, it's um, educated um, really the, the private sector in the, in the UK, uh, sorry, the private sector businesses in China, um, and its uh, alumni are mostly um, from that group. Um, it has um, extremely famous alumni, uh, which you may have heard of, including Jack Ma and others. Um, and um, its faculty are mostly educated in the US and have returned to China. Um, so they're um, a pretty um, uh, world worldly wise group of individuals. Um, and Shi KGSB is the lead partner for our academic content and standards. Um, Paul, can we have the next slide, please? So in terms of the design of this program, um, we thought it would be a great idea to kick off uh, over the six week um, process with an export diagnostic, which is a sort of look under the bonnet uh, with the Deloitte Ageability team at, at where you are. Uh, and, and that will be different for different firms uh, covering the key areas and a sort of health check of how things are functioning or, or how you're thinking about uh, your export opportunity. Um, after that quite intense period, which would require about six hours, that, uh, 12 hours of your time that week, uh, we move into the executive education phase, which is an online uh, learning program delivered by Chung Kong Graduate School of Business and its faculty, um, with the support of a business mentor um, or for people from both Ageability and Deloitte. Um, one of those is, of course, Bob Grace, who's the former president of Jaguar Land Rover China, who is an alumni of the school. He he went on the CKGSB Country Manager Programme way back when I was the head of Europe there. Um, but also um, Bob was uh, one of the key people who led JLR's uh, success story in, in building those exports up to over six billion a year. Um, so that is an intense academic process um, and is designed to give you the knowledge and experience, uh, the knowledge and, uh, and the insights that you need in terms of understanding China right now, right today. Um, and then we go into a phase of understanding how that new learning that you've acquired uh, applies to your business, working with the business mentors, um, and then uh, finally into a business planning phase. Um, and I think there's an important thing there just to highlight in terms of what Andrew said earlier about um, working with the Chinese partners. Um, often it's about behavior and changing your behavior and having that sort of mentoring as you go through it and, and, and that sort of critical friend to turn to when you're perhaps changes, facing some challenges um, is, is a key part of that. Um, so the idea is really to bring together a comprehensive package uh, to provide the support to UK businesses that they need. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So broadly speaking, that's the journey. Um, it's um, six weeks, part-time, export diagnostic, uh, academic sessions, uh, coaching, and uh, elective sessions, um, which are delivered by practitioners. Um, so that's the uh, that's the program. I think it's really important to underline that as part of this process, uh, the individuals who attend will get a certification from the business school and become part of the CKGSB International Alumni Community. Um, and of course, as part of this process at the end of, of the period, um, Deloitte and CKGSB are in a position to better help you in terms of identifying different partners um, across China, depending on what your needs are. Um, we very much hope at some point to be able to take cohorts back to China, um, but we don't anticipate that will be likely for some time yet. So at the, at the present, this is all entirely online. 
Um, so in terms of whether it's like for you, you're the only people who can decide that. Um, I think the only thing uh, or the best thing to do is to have a conversation with us um, and we can have an honest chat about whether we think um, this is right for you. We're ultimately interested in export success for the UK. Um, so we're not going to be advising people who are not suited for the programme to join. Um, but visit our website, uh, download the brochure, check it out and get in touch um, if you're interested. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Ollie. That's really appreciated and very, very, very interesting. Um, OK, we're just coming to the end now. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? There we are. Poll number five. Um, do you think exporting to China will be the key to your future career? Um, so if you could answer that, please. Uh, no, possibly, maybe, yes, definitely. So yes, if I could ask you to just to uh, uh, to fill those uh, fill, fill those answers in, and uh, we'll have a quick look at that, and then we will finish the webinar. Okay, do we have the uh, do we have those results? Yes, I'm interested in learning more. Definitely the highest uh, uh, the highest there. Some possibles, not not for uh, not several more years. A few definites there, but not very many no's. So I think uh, I think overall, perhaps this webinar has perhaps persuaded a few people that, uh, that exporting to China is for them. Thank you very much, everybody. It only remains for me to thank our speakers: John Edwards, Andrew Caney, David Percival, Kevin Shakespeare and Ollie Cheel, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much.